Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our digital event. My name is Andy Bridge, and some of you may recognize me from the webinars that we ran earlier in the summer from right after lockdown through to July. What we've decided to do now is have a new series of webinars and also give you the option uh, to interact with the exhibitors who are taking place in this digital event. So it's a month long program of activity kicking off today, going all the way through to the end of the month with uh, a scope of webinars cov covering buying and owning property in a range of destinations and also some exhibitors with whom you can speak and prepare yourself for an overseas property purchase. You may also recognize a couple of other people who were here with me during the webinars earlier in the summer and are here again. First of all, let me introduce you to Liz, Liz Rowlandson. How are you, Liz? Hi, good morning, Andy. I'm good, thank you. And tell us a little bit about yourself for people who are new to this. I'm an international property journalist. i um, been doing it for 20 years now. Um, started off on newspapers, um, joined Place in the Sun uh, nine years ago, and um, uh, have been looking after the magazine, which is, I think, uh, the UK's only overseas property magazine um, that's still left. Um, and love doing the, the exhibitions, um, virtual or live, um, covering, meeting people um, from all, all around Europe, the world. Um, travel when I can. I'm just sort of beginning to dip my toe in again and um, looking forward to things picking up. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll be, um, we'll be using your experience and knowledge over the course of the month to uh, hopefully point people in the right direction of going about buying a property uh, the right way. Also, um, your experience, Richard. Richard Way, how are you today? Good morning, Andy. Good morning, everyone. Liz, uh, I'm well, thank you. Um, yeah, like Liz, I've been writing about overseas property for magazines and websites, um, a bit for the papers since, well, not quite 20 years, but getting on for, for uh, two decades. Um, I began writing about Spain only in a dedicated Spanish uh, magazine for Spanish um, fans of Spain and homeowners in Spain. Um, and then I got involved with A Place in the Sun. I was, in fact, at the launch event of A Place in the Sun live. Um, which you, you were there, Andy, I believe. Um, yeah. Um, so I've been, um, I've seen this show evolve and grow and, and uh, I've seen it help hundreds, if not thousands of people realise their dream of buying an overseas property. And, and hopefully I understand how, you know, how useful these events can be, whether it's um, a live event or a digital event. Um, well, that's what, that's what we're looking to do with this, with this, with this new venture is, um, we can't be at the NEC where we normally would be next weekend uh, for three days. And those live events are unique. You can, you can go on our website, make property inquiries, but actually being able to meet the exhibitors face to face, talk to estate agents, talk to lawyers, actually interact and ask your very own questions is a, uh, it, it's a unique experience, isn't it? It is. And I think, I mean, I've done, Although, I mean, I used to do Liz's job as well. I was editor for a while and, and used to do web, um, not webinars, seminars, live seminars with panellists from exhibitors at the show. Um, and I still do uh, help out at, at some of the events. So I've seen how I think they are some of the most useful parts of, of the actual event is listening to, um, you know, a selected group of experts in their fields, talking to people um, face to face, taking questions, uh, sharing different people's questions and inquiries and they raise things that you might not have thought about um, and people who make the effort to go to these events or get involved with them I think those are the sort of people you want to be working with uh, when you're buying abroad because they're proactive and, and they know that um, they're happy to go and you know make the effort to come to the UK or, or register online and digitally and do these events so um, I think it's a great filtering process for finding the right sort of people to help you buy abroad. And of course, you know, get, we get to meet the people who like who are listening now who want to to buy wherever it is, Spain, France, Italy, Portugal, um, which I really enjoy. I mean, that's that's one of the best parts of, of writing about overseas property is speaking and meeting to people, the people who are actually buying. Yeah, I think you feel the same, don't you, Liz? We've got a, um, a new series of A Place in the Sun on TV at the moment, and um, I have it on every afternoon as I'm working from home. And that, that scene at the end when people 
have their offer accepted and the tears well up and the hugs start. It's um, it's it, it's a really special moment, isn't it? It is, and it the shows. I mean, okay, even even when we've been doing the the webinars in um, in in June to replace the live show. Um, you get to interact with people um, and find out what they really want. You get some feedback about, uh, even some positive feedback about a couple of people who actually ended up buying this summer. Um, but it's it's a, it's a unique chance to get everyone, um, all the experts together, finding out those local nuggets of information that you won't get by looking at properties or guides online. Uh, I find it the most useful, these, these events, the most useful in the, in the whole, my whole calendar because everyone is there chatting um, uh, uh, digitally at the moment and sharing um, all those useful bits of extra information. Yeah, I think when, when people approach the concept of, of buying an overseas property, naturally there's this level of excitement. Um, and then for some people also, there's a, little bit of trepidation as to how to go about it. And you know, what we want to cover off today is just how people can, can move through that. And obviously you don't have to become an expert in overseas property conveyancing yourself, but you need to find somebody who is. Um, and again, that's a purpose of this event is introducing you to an agent, uh, to a lawyer, to, to various companies that can help you uh, with your overseas property purchase. So today's Today's webinar is a quick overview on the do's and don'ts of how to approach that process. We're also going to have a quick look around the new website. So we've got a new website that just launched this morning where all the information about this month long digital event is held. So it's got all the webinars that you can sign up to. And crucially as well, it's got all the exhibitor pages where you can go on those pages, see an exhibitor, see what they've got to sell, the properties they promote, the services they offer, and you can interact with them via a Zoom call or you can message them, or in some cases you can WhatsApp them as well. So we're trying to make that communication as easy as possible between um, you, a potential buyer, and the exhibitors who can help you through that process. And the other element we have on our website, which we'll come on to, is our help desk. That's populated by people from the Place in the Sun team, and we'll be publishing a schedule when that's open. And again, you're welcome to drop in there via a Zoom call or just message us your questions and we can try and help and point you in the right direction. Another motivation for doing this is that clearly there is huge, huge interest out there for people looking to buy. Our website traffic over the summer has been uh, pretty much double where we were this time last year and it was already large and now it's it, it it's enormous we've had to take out additional server capacity and all sorts of stuff so there's a lot of people out there looking at properties inquiring on properties obviously the number of people who want to move through and then make a, a purchase who are that serious is um uh, is, is going to be fewer at this at any particular moment um but there's a there's a for a whole number of of reasons there are a lot of people out there who are interested in buying um, an overseas property. So what, what do you think, Richard, if I can come to you first, that, that kind of volume of, 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 of interest, what is it that sort of holds people back? And what are the, today's, today's session is titled The Do's and the Don'ts. What are the, what are the things they should look at to help them move through and be able to practically approach an overseas property purchase? Yeah, well, I might as well mention it now, Brexit. <laughs> I'm sure, well, I know from speaking to people, it has, it's maybe not put people off, but it's certainly made people wait, or some people wait. They want to see how things pan out uh, and what their options will be after the end of this very, at the moment, it's the critical deadline end of this year when um, really we, we actually stop being members of, of the EU. So UK citizens are no longer have those transferable rights. Um, the other, the other reason, has caused a bit of a surge is that a lot of people are trying to move before that because they know that if they do move before the end of the year they take they they get all the rights still and they can retain them after the end of the year so there's two things happening um but what is it that attracts people i think it's i mean the sunshine the culture the lifestyle the the ability to afford perhaps your dream property that you wouldn't maybe in the uk you know if you go to parts of spain and you can buy a two bed townhouse or, or a two bed apartment. Um, 
you know, for less than 100,000 euros often, or certainly you'd have a good choice between 100 and 200,000 euros um, of your dream type of property, and you'll be within walking distance of the beach with a promenade and a nice selection of cafes and restaurants where you can, you know, um, fulfill that lifestyle you've always wanted to. And, and being part of the EU has, has facilitated that, you know, with things uh, such as your access to healthcare if you're a pensioner, um, being able to move money freely between the two countries, that won't stop, but it's, um, uh, and your, your healthcare, I've said healthcare rights, your residency rights, if you've got children, putting them to school. So those sorts of things, you know, have, have really helped in, in the last, uh, last decades when we've been, you know, thousands of Brits have been moving to all over Europe. And that's still going to be possible, but we're just waiting to see how the structure of, of doing that changes a bit after Brexit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's lifestyle, affordability. Um, you hear people saying they've had enough of the UK and, and the way the country is today. And, uh, you know, whether it's politics or the economy or job opportunities. Um, and we've got this great, you know, continental expanse over the channel they're waiting for people to go and, and tap into it okay well you did bring the elephant in the room up um quite quite early on there but let's just uh let's just see if other people share your view i'm just going to stick a question on the screen there which i hope all our audience can see there's a question there for you is brexit holding you back it's a fairly blunt way of putting it but let's see if it's a a yes or a no and what sort of percentages what we don't want is 48 52 that would be far too um uh in line with the result four years ago and let's see where that settles down we're going to close the polling now so that's interesting 56 percent of people it's not holding them back at all 44 percent it is uh holding back to some degree so um, not far off a off a off a fifty fifty split. Um, do you think, Liz, people uh, people's kind of natural position is to be cautious about something uh, something like this? I mean, buying a holiday home is it, it's a big step, but it's not going to be that different whether we do it this year or next year. Really, I don't think. No, and I think Richard covered the whole Brexit sort of sentiments really well. But actually, I think COVID has actually made a lot of people completely reassess, uh, re reset their, want to reset their lives. And whether it's relocating to a more sort of a, a, a sort of a rural sort of a out location abroad, or whether the, the capacity to remote work has really opened up people's options. So I've interviewed a lot of people this summer who've realized that they can do remote working or remote schooling, especially if their company said they don't need them back until next uh, for a long time and they're just looking to um to just move they might not have been looking to move last year but they are looking to move now um and obviously people are cautious but there's a, a feeling that one has to sort of seize opportunities um and and seize the moment and 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 get on with their life because we've noticed you know life life can be quite hard in this, it has been hard in, in cities over the last few weeks. Um, so people are just wanting to have a, just, just think about the way they're gonna live their life a bit more. I think that's right. And um, I think a, a, a good sort of mantra when it comes to buying an over, overseas property is uh, don't rush it, but do get on with it. Mm. You, could, you could prevaricate for years and years and years looking for the perfect this or the perfect that. Um, if you've taken the decision uh, that that is something that want, you want to do and you think it will enhance, enhance your lifestyle, then um, you know, getting out and viewing properties is quite, is, is quite difficult and quite time consuming. Um, it is a big step, um, but at some point, if you're gonna take the plunge, you need, to, you need to take that plunge. So thinking of that, I mean, we know sort of top line there's, you know, find a location and a property, find an agent and find a lawyer. Uh, we're gonna do a session on Thursday, which is more about more detail on the steps involved in that process. But thinking of today's session and do's and don'ts, Richard, um, just chat us through a, a relationship with, um, with an agent and how that comes about, how, comes about and how you can make the most of that sort of expertise that they have at their end. Yeah, 
Uh, the first thing to say is is that you know you might think you, you you buy property in the UK, you bought and sold a few properties in the UK, um, and you know and you know the ropes, you know how things work, conveyancing. But if you're buying in Spain or France or wherever, you're buying. First of all, there's the language barrier. Uh, I don't know how. Not many people actually are confident enough to read a contract in French or Spanish or or some version of property law that they need to know about. Um, so you've got to think about language. The, the laws, the regulations, the, the conveyancing system is different. Um, just the very fact it's notarized in most of Europe. We don't have a notarized system in the UK. Um, you know, you don't really, you think you know an area, you think you know a resort from holidays, but unless you've actually bought property and had to, to deal with notaries and, and local agents and, um, you know, you haven't really experienced that side of being somewhere. So going into a transaction, which for most people will involve, um, you know, the proceeds of, of their biggest UK asset, their home, um, or other lifetime investments and savings, and, and not taking or, or using the advice and, and the help of other people, um, to me is, is, is crazy. And it's, people still do it. They go over to to a part of the Europe and they, they like to think they can do it alone and they meet an agent in a bar. They don't think they need to, to employ a lawyer because you don't have to always employ a lawyer if the notary is going to, to seal the transaction, but you haven't done any research. You haven't checked the finer details of, of the contract or the laws. Um, and then people do get caught out. So, and that's one of the things this show is, is there is to equip people with all the people that you need um, and to, to help you achieve that that uh, that dream successfully and without uh, and safely um, I mean the key people really you mentioned the agent you need an agent a good agent a good lawyer independent lawyer who's bilingual and understands uh, and is experienced in dealing with the location where you're going to be buying and also the other big thing to think about is currency because uh, we don't have to deal with currency exchange when we're buying in the UK normally if we've got UK and we've got sterling we're buying in sterling but it can make a big difference uh, when you're having to move pounds to euros and you haven't uh, followed or, or checked what the exchange rate is between finding a property and completing. So a good currency transfer firm will advise you on that and guide you through that. But the agent is a good one because their role is, is, is different in Spain, France, Italy. Um, over here, you generally, you know, a, a, an agent's role is quite simply defined. You know, they help you find a property and then, they generally set the exchange up and completion and, and that's it. But you're, when you're moving to, especially if you're moving, but, or even having a second home, you need to, there's other things you need to do. You need to set up a financial identity. You need to get a, a tax number. You need to open a bank account. You need to find a notary. You need to um, find your way around. And a good agent will help you do that. They do a lot more than just be involved with the, keeping the transaction on course. Um, a lot of agents, who will be taking part in this event will themselves have started their journey abroad probably as a buyer and a lot of them end up becoming agents or working for a local agency because they enjoy it uh, and they want to do something and help out when they're there so they understand what what people are going through when they arrive in a country and buy the first property there uh, and they often end up becoming good friends with their clients because a lot of them you know you buy in the same area and and there will there will be an expat community and people know each other um so there's you know their role is far more involved and extensive um and after sales is, is a big thing as well with agents when you are speaking to agents ask them how they help people out who've just moved abroad or have a second home you know will they help you if your air conditioning packs up and you need to change it or you you know you have uh, you need to get satellite dish installed or whatever it is it's all those extra things that uh, normally in the UK you might you know you look after yourself but out there especially if you're not there as a second home and you need things helping uh, with the property then you know they'll usually have people there who will you know and often at very little or no charge they'll they'll advise you will put you in touch with the right people um, so that yeah finding the right agent is, is, is really really important you're halfway there when you found a good agent who will um, you know and they'll get to understand exactly what you're looking for um, and their role is more, they're more, a good agent will be your eyes and ears on the ground when you're looking for a property. You don't usually need more than one or two agents working for you because they will know where you want to buy and they will know most of the properties that are on the market, whether it's through their own listings or 
they'll be speaking to other local agents and they will help to to find all the all the feasible options for you and then um you'll go and do a viewing trip and uh which we'll probably talk about later but yeah you'll go out and they'll they'll take you around show you what you want to see and then hopefully it will lead to to uh to a sale okay well let's um i'm just going to share my screen um and hope that this will um, come up for you so as uh, some of you may know, we, we have the website aplaceinthesun.com, um, but we have launched this new website today, which is aplaceinthesundigital.co.uk. Um, and talking about the exhibitors, this is our uh, Meet the Exhibitors page. So um, lovely uh, intro from the lovely Jasmine Harmon there. I can leave you to watch that at your leisure. Uh, and then the list of the exhibitors taking part um, by country. So the name of the company here. Um, and if you click on one of these tiles, this will link through to the agent or the lawyer. It will link through to their page. Uh, in this case, it's uh, Casas Manuel, who uh, a well-established agent, uh, estate agency on the Costa Blanca. And this gives you information about Casas Manuel. I'll come back to this a little bit in a moment. We've got some virtual property tours. So if you click on these, uh, Casas Manuel have supplied these. These are properties they've got, the latest properties they've got for sale um, with the latest pricing information. Uh, looking at this, we've got a top floor apartment, another apartment, and here a three bedroom villa with a private pool. So you can look through those properties. Additionally, there's a property carousel here. So more of their portfolio that they're currently making available. Some information about the Casas Manuel team. You may have seen these guys on a, on a certain TV show. And some of their corporate brochures. And there's a message box there. If you want to ask them a question, you can just put your question in and send it there. But ideally, if you are wanting to pick their brains, uh, the best thing to do is to book a meeting with them. So these are the time slots that Casas Manuel have chosen to make available. You simply go on here and say, okay, I'd like a chat with you via a Zoom call. Let me click on here. Yeah, 9.30 to 10 o'clock tomorrow. Put in your name, let's put in my name. And permission to use your information to take to make bookings. You need to tick that for it to be able to work and click book and that now goes to Casas Manuel via an email and they will confirm back that that meeting is okay and in the email will be generated a link to a zoom meeting then at 9 30 that on the, on that day you just click the link and you're in a zoom meeting uh, with Casas Manuel and can put your questions to them so that's the idea here um, that we've tried to to develop is this page holds all the different elements you typically find on an exhibition stand. So we can't physically give you the, people, the lovely people from Casas Manuel, but um, we can present them to you via a Zoom call and you can also take some of their brochures, look at the properties they've got for sale, uh, go on some virtual property tours, ask them questions. So the idea of course here, here is that you're interacting with them digitally rather than going in and uh, coming into our exhibition hall at the NEC or Olympia or Manchester and sitting down on a stand with them. The concept here is that we're trying to replicate that experience and give you face-to-face, -face, in this case, virtual, digital, face-to-face -face time um, with an experienced estate agent who can talk you through uh, and answer your questions. Some other areas on the website, um, this is our welcome page. This will get updated every day. Um, tells you what's going on. Tells you about this, the webinars this week. The webinars take place on the hub. So if you haven't booked all your webinars yet, this is our program of webinars. A little bit of explanation. We've got a fun quiz on Friday night for anybody who fancies it. Questions about the history of a place in the sun. And we have a very special guest joining us for that, which should be fun. Um, 
with you, Liz, we have a wonderful, um, well, I'm saying wonderful, it's going to be wonderful, right? We've got a wonderful yeah. revisited program. So this is people who've been on the TV show, in this case, Andy and Linda May, coming back on for a webinar. Uh, we run some footage from the original TV show. And Liz, you're going to see, I guess, how their life has turned out. Is that right? This is one of my favorite bits of this job is actually, and, and one of the questions we get asked so often, can, can we see what happened to this couple who bought on the TV show? So I love, um, I love finding out um, sort of what happened next, how they got on and, um, and, and just um, and learning, you know, learning from, from having a chat with them as, as uh, listeners can do. Yeah, absolutely. It's always interesting to, um to hear what people, the, the, the information people have accrued during this process. It's kind of like, it's information you probably only need once. It's a lot of information to get your head around it. You need it for this transaction and then you don't really need it again. But typically buyers are very uh, willing and, and, and like passing on that sort of information about how it's, how it's helped them. We also have uh, what we're calling a, a property masterclass day. So the first one is Sunday, the 6th of September. And this is a series of webinars, half hour, 45 minute, one hour webinars, all back to back during the course of Sunday. And you can join one of them, you can join all of them. Um, and that takes you through how to get a mortgage with a mortgage broker. Um, we speak to lawyers about the buying process. We speak to estate agents about their role in the transaction. Uh, we speak to a currency company that Richard referenced earlier about how to save money on your transaction. Um, we're speaking to a company about uh, making a, per a permanent move and what's involved uh, in, in moving your assets overseas. We have a healthcare provider talking about options post Brexit. And we also have all the exhibitors on screen at the end of the day for an informal chat. So there's a there's a, there's a wide ranging program on, on Spain on Sunday the 6th, and then that gets repeated throughout the month at the weekends on other countries, on France, on Portugal, uh, and on Florida, Cyprus. So um, keep an eye out on here for uh, all the webinar program. And Andy, have... if people miss one of these, can they go back and find it after a recording? Yeah, absolutely. So what we're doing is we're doing them live like this, and then uh, the next day, they should be live in our on-demand sessions. So you can just go back and catch up with them. Uh, we will have another link on here somewhere. Where are we? Yep. So once the first one's been completed, like today, and recorded, it will then be put up here in the on-demand area. So as we move through the month of September, I think we have 50, we actually have 54 individual webinars. Each one then will be captured, recorded and placed, placed here. So this section will grow throughout the month of September as the live sessions still to come get used up um, and then posted here as a recording. So um, I think we're keeping both of you pretty busy throughout uh, September, Richard. Uh, yeah, no, I'm gonna be involved with, um, with, a, with a number of them. Uh, France, I believe. Uh, the master class and then um, I'm going to be doing um, hosting uh, the sessions on Cyprus uh, and Florida as well so two contrast contrasting places to buy and we'll be going right into the nitty-gritty of all those things that um, it'll mirror the, 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 the one in Spain that Andy's just been through so we'll be talking about um, the buying process um, and legalities buying in Florida getting mortgage there um, choosing where to buy uh, and things are done differently in Florida, especially they have zoning for short lets. Uh, the conveyancing process is a bit different and your agent there really is, um, really does have a different role to in the UK. They, they're called realtors. They have to be, re they're regulated. They have to um, uh, pass uh, tests, every, I think every year. So that they are, um, have a very involved role in your purchase. But uh, you can find out about all that when we do the Florida ones, which is I think, uh, three weeks time or four weeks time it's towards the second half of the month anyway yeah um, we published uh, to date we published the webinars that are taking place in the first two weeks so we'll be adding the second two weeks shortly uh, but for now we've got the first two weeks schedule is is live on the website um so i think what we're saying liz is is 
do get involved and don't be shy. I mean, these exhibitors, uh, I should say that they're paying exhibitors. So like they pay to take a stand at our exhibition, they pay to be part of this event and we're grateful for their support in what is a, uh, a bit of a leap of faith to see if we can um, get all this wonderful interaction going digitally rather than in the live event. So yeah, do get involved and don't be shy. That's what we're wanting people to do, Liz, isn't it? So to sort of not, not feel nervous about dropping in and having a Zoom chat with someone. Well, yeah, and funny enough, I just saw a news item in the Daily Mail this morning saying that people are actually having more meetings on now, now that they can do them online than in person. So for some people, it's a, just an easy and more comfortable way of doing it. So I think this event is perfect for, for, for doing that. Uh, you know, you, we, you won't, might not have to physically travel somewhere, but it's all here. And I, I think what is great, that's perhaps an advantage on even our, our, our live events that were popular is that you've got very tailored sessions on specific aspects. So if you only want to learn about the healthcare in Spain, you've got a dedicated session to that or the, um, or the re relocation, the residency process in Cyprus, etc. So I think um, th there's nowhere else that offers this level of, of detail uh, in one place over um, a, such a wider range of countries. And, and can I just say, we should highlight that you know we invite as many questions as possible you know that are obviously relevant to the session um which is easy enough to do isn't it you just type in the the q a I'm, I'm glad you teed that one up for me richard because uh, i was going to say another do is do ask yeah. questions and on the zoom panel um if you're watching at home you should be able to see ask a question there's a little interaction at the bottom where you can ask a question and we do have uh, some in already. Cindy Callender actually asked your question, Liz. She asked, uh, could she watch this as a recording if she can't make it live? So we've we've covered we've covered that one. Um, and we also have a question from uh, Nicola Carlin. Now, ultimately, I guess this is a question best addressed to the agents. But let's try and give an overview. Nicola asks, do you think property prices will go up after Brexit? Most people ask that question. Do you think they'll go down? But but Nicola's asked it. Do you think they will? they will go up. Obviously, uh, Nicola, we're not sure where you're referring to in which particular market, and it's, uh, it's a big world out there. But Richard, what would you, um, what would, what would you give more generally now as an, as an answer about, about property prices in, in particular markets? I'm thinking of possibly, the, let's think about the most popular one in Spain at the moment. Um, I think, I mean, this, people were asking this question as soon as lockdown began, um, and um, you know, people stopped stop going out there and completing transactions and uh, and they were talking about the market collapsing and, and it hasn't um, I think you might see you might see a small dip you might see um, there's I mean inevitably they're going to be people who have had to put up there if they were thinking of selling just before lockdown and, and then obviously their whole process has been slowed up because uh, because they haven't been able to get people out to view uh, and if people who need to sell quickly, it's delayed everything, then then, yeah, there's going to be more urgency for them to find a buyer. But, um, you know, I think generally if people are up for sale before the lockdown <clears throat> and they can wait, they're, they're not going to necessarily drop their prices because because of, you know, the lockdowns, if they can afford to keep the prices as they are. So you, I think it will be a case of there could be opportunities, but you've got to go and find them um, and find those people who, you know, who need to sell and they've had to delay because of lockdown. Um, or they're in a rush to get back to the UK uh, for whatever reason before Brexit. Um, but I don't predict this crash that some people are almost trying to talk talk the market into doing because they want to go and find um, find big opportunities. And, and um, uh, I don't think we're in the same. You know, people have been talking about the 2008 crash and these opportunities, but the market is a very different place to to what it was back then. You know, there were a lot. There was a lot of overdevelopment. There was a lot of um, uh, developments that had been built uh, and they were never going to find buyers a lot of these places because they were in the wrong place or, you know, there was, the market was saturated, it was overheating and and these things are cyclical, cyclical and they do, you know, they do have a point where they just uh, burst and I, the market wasn't at that point before lockdown and it's not now. So it's a different landscape. Um, so I don't see a huge shift. I mean, there could, there could be a small shift, but but there could be some good opportunities, but it's not going to be the general trend, I don't think. Yeah. I think where there is an opportunity, Liz, and 
I think to uh, to reference Nicola again, I don't think this is anything to do with Brexit particularly, no. but um, there is always an opportunity if you're a well-prepared buyer, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, I think COVID's going to have much more of an impact than Brexit on prices. It's just, um, you know, it, local economies are going to have an impact and um, lo local demand in the specific countries. So, um, um, I, I, I actually think, I mean, some countries' prices are actually you know, sort of stable or going up at the moment because of local demand or the goal or, or people moving around buying, taking up golden visas, etc. So um, I think it's very, it's going to be very localised. I know the French market is very buoyant at the moment because all the French are moving. So yeah, um, yeah I think uh, it's an interesting one. And the French market is a good example of, of how, you know, different countries are very different. It's a, if you look at what most well, a big percentage of British people buy in France. It is the rural, um, you know, sort of converted barn or a, a rural property, you know, on the edge of a village and um, where they can live that sort of rustic French lifestyle. Uh, and France has, you know, plenty of, of unsold properties like that. The market, it's a slow moving market, France. It's been stagnant and just starting to rise in the last decade. It's, it's not... Uh, so it's something like COVID or even Brexit. It's because of its, it's sort of like this big sluggish mass of mural properties that it's not going to suddenly uh, drop or, or rise. Um, so yeah, I'd say it's, whereas when you get big pockets of development where if it is overdeveloped, you know, that sort of thing can have a bigger sh shift impact on the local market. Um, yep. And um I forgot what I was going to say. Actually, I had another. Let, let me let me jump in then. So, if you um, if you're watching this and decided you 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 did want to interact with with our exhibitors, uh, the lawyers and the estate agents, what what would we mean? What, what's an what's a, what's an estate agent looking for in deeming you kind of a a ready a ready buyer rather than maybe a very early stage uh, person, Richard? What do you think? What does an agent like to see? the buyer yeah. has potentially considered or the point that they're at. We're going to do this in more detail on Thursday, but just, yeah. just a top line for us. Uh, same old, same as over here. They love, if you've got a mortgage in principle, if you can be buying with a mortgage, I mean, that shows seriousness. Yeah. Um, if you've got your UK house in the market, if you're relocating, um, you know, all those things that, you know, take effort to do and show a, an amount of seriousness financially especially then um and they want to if you can go out there that shows a very you know that shows a high level of, of obviously at the moment it's difficult with, with flight restrictions but um um yeah so mortgage in principle house on the market uh, yeah. or proof of or a big bag of, or a big bag of cash from your retirement or inheritance or... yeah yeah uh, those kind of things um they, you know that, that shows you you're ready to to seriously start looking we've had a question in from uh, katrina campbell she said we viewed a number of properties online already uh, and we found some that meet our requirements but we're unable to travel again uh, another elephant in the room at the moment uh, or walk around the area and see what it's like is there a way to overcome this is it something that an agent can help with well i think it's fair to say liz that there's no replacement for going and walking around and touching and feeling the place and knowing ultimately what it's like but this event gives more of an opportunity. A lot of the agents now have virtual property tours on their websites. Yes, I know. I know talking to a couple of our um, regular agents that they were trying to get out and do virtual tours of areas, giving, um, giving buyers a sort of walk around experience that they're, they're missing out on physically, as well as virtual tours of individual properties. So I think I would, yeah, talk to, look at, look at agent websites and see how much the, you know, a lot of the proactive ones will be really doing this so that you can um, get as much out of, um, uh, not, you know, sort of doing your research online as possible. Okay. Um, a question here from, uh, I didn't, didn't leave the name and that's fine. Uh, references the point I made about the estate agents paying to take part. Um, uh, do we take under vetting, uh, undertake any vetting of the agents? Well, well, no, nor do we at the, at the exhibitions, um, nor do we if they're advertising in the magazine, but nor does the Times or the Telegraph, um, you know, people t 
pay to take commercial space and that's that's what it is i think it is fair to say that these clients are um they're, they're regular exhibitors with us regular advertisers across the website and um, they are third-party companies so if you go off and do business with them it's you dealing with that company it's not it's not a place in the sun we should make that clear um a lot of them have been around a long time but then ultimately it's up to you to do your due diligence um, get your lawyer ultimately the lawyers acting for your interests and the estate agent a bit of an oversimplified simplification but in most cases is acting for the vendor um and then that's just like uh, any other transaction in the same way that if you go on right move there's a load of properties listed um, if you go on the place in the sun.com, there's a load of properties listed by multiple different agents around the world. So no, we don't, we don't trot off and check them all out. That'd be a lovely job, but um, no, that's not something uh, that we do. Um, I'll just say as well, I, I always take a view that if people, if agents, developers, or whatever their services are choosing and actively doing these sorts of events, mm. um, whether it's the live events or this format um you know they're actually putting themselves out there in front of people and they're they're, they're flag waving they're showing people their names they want you to come and meet them um they want to talk to you and, and they want exposure um typically if if you're dealing with a, a rotten agent or whatever type of business it is they don't want to put their head above the parapet normally they want to sort of lurk in the shadows and try and get deals where they can so i I see people who do these events as people who, you know, they're, they're kind of saying, this is us, come and meet us as we've got nothing to hide. And, um, as, you know, rather than trying to pick up clients in, uh, you know, less transparent ways. Um, but that's, that's how I do it. I think it's a good thing. Yeah, I agree. And you can put, uh, you can do a bit of your own due diligence by doing online searches on agents. And as Richard says, just like a journalist, if you choose to put yourself out there and, and write, you have a responsibility and people can, if anything is, is, is incorrect or, or inappropriate, it soon comes back to hit you. And it's the online world is a quite a, um, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a fine stuff now. So. We have a, uh, another anonymous question asking, why would you use more than one agent any tips in narrowing it down from a range of agents well i guess for most people richard the starting point is a property and then in the background is an agent representing that you referenced being able to speak to one agent who might cover the whole market yeah. um well, that that's fairly common isn't it in in it particularly in spain uh, and certainly in florida um certainly in florida i mean you don't you really don't need to use more than one realtor and he, they will be representing you as a buying agent as a realtor in florida uh, and that but we can talk about that when we in the seminar but even in spain i mean you say you start with a property and then contact the agent it's not always that way i mean a lot of people they will meet an agent uh, at an event like this um who covers the area they want to be in um and they will leave them a list of their you know what they want from their property and then leave them and they will go away and come back with options um and that is a very typical way of, of finding a property because it's not like in the uk where or you, if you've decided to move somewhere you'll go and have a drive around at the weekend and you'll look around at the streets and see properties you quite like with a for sale sign and then whoever happens to be the agent you'll contact them and um you know you can't be there doing all this this sort of research and investigative um you know driving around whatever it is so an agent will, like I said earlier, they'll be your eyes and ears. If you find a good agent that has a good listing, um, good representation of the area you want to be in, you like them, you trust them, um, and then you give them your wish list, uh, uh, and they will, the good agents, they'll listen to you. They won't try and push something on you that they don't, you know, they know you won't want. But also, they will also recognise perhaps that you're overseeing something, and they will say, well, you know, you say you want, uh, you want uh, to be in this area because of that well actually most people in your situation are, are over here and you know they'll recognize and, and offer you alternatives to view and you can say no or you can say yes but they'll give you options um, and then then they'll present you with what they think you should look at when you go out there um, and, and I said before as well a lot of the agents they'll know each other in an area and if and they all you know they they know each other they know the market they know 
what is for sale and what isn't, whether they've got it up for sale or not. And if, if there's a particular property that they know will suit you and they haven't got it on their books, they'll speak to the other agent often and they will have their own agreement between them if the sale, if the sale occurs, but it won't affect, affect you. Um, so yeah, they'll go out and find, find exactly what they think, you know, exactly what you want. Um, which is a good thing when you're, you know, back in the UK and you can't be doing all that searching yourself. And yeah. seeing stuff online is one thing, but I mean, it goes without saying until you actually get there and see it, it's, you know, you can get an idea of prices and an area, but you really need to go and, and actually see the property, uh, certainly with resale and, you know, when it's a new project and there's a show home and you've got plans, it might be a bit different, but um, I mean, as a real life example, and this could apply anywhere, I'm looking to move house at the moment. I went to see a house on Saturday Everything looked perfect on the on the listing. Uh, got there, uh, saw the house, liked it. Opened the back door, stood in the garden, and the, the the noise from the road, the dual carriageway, which actually isn't that close, was unbelievable. And immediately that was it. I said, "No, you won't. You don't get that from a listing." Um, yeah. So it's things like that. But uh, okay. We've got Ni Nigel Beaumont is doing a good job of keeping us on track on here. He said, "How about telling us a few more don'ts?" or pitfalls that should be avoided. I was going to mention one, Liz, uh, it brings us on to the, the issue of viewing trips. Um, for people who, who are not aware, viewing trips is a term that can be uh, can fall into a couple of categories. One, uh, you might take a subsidized viewing trip where an estate agent or a developer pays part of your costs to go out. So if you are doing that, um, and it's a very valid way to go and see a particular property or portfolio of properties, then, you know, do be aware that uh, your time will be taken up viewing that agent or that developer's properties and don't try and abuse um, that interaction to go off and see properties with other agents. That's sometimes a bit of a, a thorny area. Um, if you'd rather use uh, go under your own steam, then you'd fly out to a particular place and you'd say to the agent, can you pick me up on Saturday at nine o'clock and we'll go and see the properties that we've agreed you're going to show me. Um, so the do's and don'ts of a viewing trip, Liz, is that is that sort of a fair, a fair summary? Yes, I think it is because really uh, uh, the viewing trips have evolved since the sort of the hard sell era of the um, uh, of, of fifteen twenty years ago, and a lot more of them are a lot more flexible and independent. So because agents realise that people do want to sort of um, have a have a broad look around, so I would. I would know it just know what you're getting into when you book a trip what what are the, what does the agent expect from you and what do you expect from them clarify that before you sign up or get on the airplane and and you know are you going to be seeing um eight properties a day which is perhaps too many or are you going to be seeing four uh, three or four and you want to be having driven around the areas to get to know the um the localities um what, what's your priority trying to to clarify that um also take photographs note take notes because just like when i go on see properties you can't you don't expect to remember them just just really um try to record record them and, and really kind of just use the opportunity to pick the brains of the people showing you the properties for e anything you want and and really mi milk the opportunity that you're getting from the these people spending time with you yeah and i think buying rich's reference buying in the uk versus buying overseas there. i mean buying in the uk you can very have a very specific idea about where you need to be you want to be in the catchment area of a certain school, which in London might be 80 metres or something ludicrous. Whereas in a holiday home, you like the Costa Blanca, the northern bit, you might be an hour from an airport. You've got, you've got, more, uh, you've, you've got, you've got a, more, a more open range of possibilities there. So it is about finding an area that, that you like, that you have good access to, uh, and that suits, ultimately, I guess, suits the lifestyle that you want to live. Uh, there was a question in there from, uh, again, no name, but asking about what advice you'd, you'd give about going on viewing trips. So I think we've, I think we've covered that. Um, we, we've got a couple of specific questions in about residency and Brexit and income levels that you need. I think we're going to cover that more in, in specific webinars, if you'd like to, uh, Cherie, Cherie Bell. Uh, but Richard, 
just to give a bit of insight, she's, she's asked, I've read the post-Brexit residency will be only considered if your income is 2,130 euros per calendar month. Is, is, is that correct? There's quite a lot of detail around that, isn't that? And a lot of it that's still to be decided. Absolutely. I mean, just to just to make it clear, even now, if you're if you're going for residency in Spain, you will need to prove income. You'll need to prove uh, what your pension is uh, each month, um, and it, and the amount. In some cases, they might ask for to show um, proof of of a, of a large savings deposit, um, and it will vary by region. Don't Spain is very regional, and and even once you get within the regions different provinces and town halls can do things a bit differently but if you just take it that you will need to, to prove your income uh, even now but i think what this lady's referring to is if if in the worst worst case scenario is you want to move to spain um and you need to get some kind of um a, a visa um like other third country nationals whether you're american you know asian uh you know australian who Plenty of those move to, to Europe, Spain, France all the time without problem. So that's it. that's encouraging that it, you know not being in the EU doesn't mean any at all that you won't be able to move there. But if you do need to, and I think they call them non-lucrative visas, so you you will have to prove a slightly higher income level um, usually if you're going for one of those types of visas, which it sounds like that's I think it's in the I've heard different um, different numbers, but it's somewhere in the range of between twenty five and thirty thousand euros per annum, which would equate to sort of what she's saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one of those visas. Um, but that is the worst case scenario. That is, we have to go through this particular visa process um, like other third country nationals. I mean, the hope is that they'll agree some other type of, even if it's different countries with the UK government, but some easier and, and less expensive passage, you know, um, yeah. getting a residency, so. And Cherie, for um, for more detail on that, uh, join the uh, the webinars where we're talking about relocating. Um, if your question's about Spain, that it be the, the relocating session on the Spain Masterclass Day on Sunday. I think it's three o'clock. Uh, we have a company on there called Blevins Franks. They specialise in um, people who are relocating and moving their financial assets overseas. But also the Spanish lawyers. I think there are four Spanish law firms listed with our, in our exhibitors section. And I think certainly two or three of them also help people get residency. So if you click on the law firm's pages, um, at the top it says our, our key services, and there you can check which of the law firms help you get residency. And on that page, you can just pop them that question. But again, do come along to, um, to the future webinars to look at that. Um, I have a question here for you, Liz, from Guy Hodge, who asks about renting in Spain. Normally, if we mention renting in Spain, our, our exhibitors think, oh, why are you talking about renting? We want to sell people a house. But there is, right now, there's a particular window available, isn't there? Would you just like to explain why people might look at that uh, as an option for getting residency if they're looking to relocate permanently before the end of the year? Well, in, in most of the EU countries that we're going to be covering, um, there's an obligation. Um, if you're applying for residency, you have to prove you're settled in the relevant country by the end of the year. So uh, but it doesn't have to be you don't have to buy a property. You can have a, a rental property. You can also actually stay in a friend's house uh, in France, for example, if you provide the rel relevant um, paperwork. So so don't yeah, don't panic if you don't think you're going to buy in time and you can take your time to look. Go and get a rental property because a lot of properties in Spain that might have not been rent rented as holiday uh, lets this summer because of travel restrictions they might be adapting to longer term I've spoken to one buyer who who did that um, while looking for his property um, uh, extended the rental um, so I think that's a really good option to, to consider doing in it, especially this autumn when um, you know as long as you provide details of a rental contract or a, a letter from the town hall in, in France for specific uh, certain circumstances then you know you can then relax and in France you don't actually have to apply for your residency until June next year so you have some breathing space. Yeah, that's, oh, okay that's true that, that's formalized now is it the extension in France until June? Yes you have you, ha you have to be settled really by the end of this year but then you have until the 30th of June to apply for your residency. 
So a 12 month yeah. rental agreement in place yeah. and quite often our exhibitors um, who are looking generally to sell properties at this event, but they also, a lot of them do cover rentals and would have long term rentals. And that's a good point you make about some of those properties being more available, more available now than they um, ordinarily would because of COVID-19. And I should point out, it's not always 12 months. It can sometimes be six months. Um, that's fine. Um, so, you know, look, look into the, we'll be talking about that under the relevant countries. So what, what you can't do, and this has been confirmed by numerous lawyers, you can't book into a hotel for <laughs> indefinitely until you and, and use that as an address for getting residency. Um, you know, people have asked that before and it's uh, you need you need a contract to show a rental contract and be able to present that. All right, we're going to just try and whiz through some more questions here. Um, I have a question specifically on Portugal. I think you should join our Portugal Day, our Masterclass Day for Portugal, which is in uh, not this weekend coming, but the weekend after. Um, or you can go on the exhibitor pages. Uh, there's a Portuguese lawyer called Paula Morelis. Um, for Portugal, do we know if the golden visa for UK citizens will apply from the 1st of January? Has anybody got a quick answer for that? Or should we suggest, Paula? Liz, you're nodding. Yes, you're not being sagely. Yeah, it, it will. The Golden Visa scheme is go, is is really popular. It just had the record, the highest ever month since 2012 in May this year. So uh, yes, it will be. Um, yeah, we, if we're out of the EU, we we can apply for it. Yes. Okay, here's an interesting one uh, that couldn't have been asked this time last year. Do you advise for or against buying virtually? I think. If you know an area and you've been there, um, then maybe it's something you would do. I do know a company down in, um, uh, a company who are doing, I think, minimum deposits for people to buy a property online. And then if they fly out, when they can fly out, they get the deposit refunded. So there's quite a bit of, there's quite a bit of innovative thinking on behalf of agents. What, what, what's your view generally, Richard? I think it's a good idea, but you know, it's a conditional, you can make it as a conditional offer. So, yeah, you know, put your deposit down, that's showing you're serious. Um, but if, you know, if you might want a clause that says if you get out there and it's really, something isn't quite right or whatever, for whatever you just don't like it, there is, there is a chance to get all, even maybe a percentage of your deposit back, but there needs to be a condition, I think. Um, and I'm sure most developers will be doing that, but it's a, it's a, you know, if you know the area, perhaps you, you're already looking at the development um, and then you've done a virtual tour and so you're, you're well informed about it. Um, then I, yeah, I don't see any harm putting a conditional offer down, a deposit down. Um, Good. Uh, Siobhan Roach asks, when physically viewing a property, are you allowed to record and take pictures on your phone? Liz, you did actually touch on that. That's a, that's a very highly advisable thing to do, isn't it? Yes, I mean, generally you are, but there might be, um, there are very wealthy buyers who are very concerned about privacy and security, um, so they might not, but I mean, generally, yes, is the answer. Okay, and Richard, it's, it's a big subject and there's not that much time left, but we are trying to uh, cover off uh, as many as we can to show we want to, we want to answer people's questions. Off plan, is off plan buying abroad Attractive, any tips to avoid potential pitfalls? Uh, yeah, I think it is a good, it's a perfectly feasible way of buying in Spain. Um, the obvious, uh, well, obvious the thing that you must ensure happens is that any, any uh, stage payments or deposits you make for completion uh, have a bank guarantee. Um, in fact, I think it's EU law that it has to be so, um, there might still be developers that assure you it's not needed, but uh, your lawyer will make sure that that happens, or they should do anyway. So that if if something were to happen before completion and the contract uh, they didn't fulfil the contract, all your money would be would be guaranteed that you paid before completion, and you'll get that back. Um, so that's that is the key top of the list bit of advice for buying off plan. Otherwise, it's the same as buying a new property here. You know, you'll go typically you'll go to to a show home, and then the builder or your agent will show you a, a plan of the development, and you can choose the plot you want. Go and see the plot. You know, stand there. Do you like the view? Get an idea of the space, uh, and then you can 
The other great thing, of course, about buying off plan is that you can start customizing it a bit. There'll be, depending on the development and the project, you might be able to run the bathroom, you'll be able to choose the finishing, uh, the tiles, the kitchen, have add a pool or not. Um, but just remember when you start to do that, you can you normally start to you'll be paying extras. Uh, and I've spoken to people before who've who've bought off plan and they've gone and seen a, a, a basic, a standard show home and then you know looks looks good value and then they've started adding bits here and there and suddenly the price has gone up <laughs> quite considerably so just bear that in mind keep 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 your finger on the pulse with that um and generally it's you know off plan got a bad name you know back before and around the crash the last big crash 2008 because a lot of developers were over overexposed financially and people did get burnt um deposits weren't guaranteed etc uh but you know speak to anyone in spain it's a different landscape now and, and developers are a lot more well they have to be there but it's more regulated everyone's far more you know clued up on what needs to be done by an off plan how to protect yourself and and it's you know it's a very common and feasible and and safe way to buy in spain now um just be sure that that's what you want as a, as a property you want something that's brand new and and you know you you if you're buying earlier on in, in, a, in a development, if you're one of the first buyers where there's not even a brick down and they haven't even started the groundworks, then you know you you are sort of putting your faith in all the computer, you know, the graphics that they show you what it will look like and, and the way it'll be landscaped. So you could say it's a you know the only chance you're taking really is it will it be turn out exactly the way you pictured it or been shown. Um, but you know the flip side to that is you'll probably pay less than someone buying later on in the in the actual build process phase so um other upsides are new properties typically you can they rent better you get a higher rent for them because they're new and everything's new and functions mm -hmm. sort of functions well uh they're built with more modern materials so they'll be more energy efficient they'll be greener um yeah, so there's a lot of pluses. It's just whether really that's what you want. Some people only like new properties. They'll buy a new property in the UK, they'll buy a new property in Spain, and they like to be the first owner. Um, but often you hear as well, I speak to people when they went to Spain thinking they, was gonna, they were going to buy a, a rural villa with a plot of land and an olive grove, and, and then they end up buying a brand new three bedroom penthouse apartment because they get there and they're completely wowed by it, and suddenly that's what they want. So. Yeah, with an open mind, but yeah, normally people know if they want you. Very good, good advice. Thank you, Richard. So we're nearing the end of the webinar. So a, a quick do from me is um, an area of the website that I didn't mention is our help desk. So if I can just bring the website up again, over here on our help desk. Again, a bit of a new concept for us all to get our head around there's uh, Laura who could only film this while she was in I think Crete last week was it Crete Liz that Laura was in last week yeah that's right um, so this is our help desk area and this is the team from um, from a place in the Sun magazine events website etc etc and myself um, you can just add your name tick that tick that and you can drop into a zoom meeting and have a chat with us and we will uh, try to answer your questions and uh, obviously our, our knowledge goes to a certain level we will point you in the director of direction of exhibitors who are more informed and can help you with that you can always just um post a message in there as well if you don't want the zoom chat just click on there and uh, put in your name your email and your message and click send and that comes to the place in the sun team we've no idea whether we're going to have 50, 500 or 5,000 people clicking that box today. We are, we are a small company and we're a small team, so bear with us. But um, yeah, do get involved, do come in. It's been deliberately a bit of a, uh, a soft launch today, tomorrow and the early part of this week before we start promoting it more heavily. So do get involved, do book the webinars, do book in with exhibitors because you don't want to miss out. Uh, the webinar limit, I think, is about 2,000 on a webinar, and we do have a lot of people signed up, some of the more popular ones already, so um, do get booked in. Once you've got your link that's been sent to you on an email, you are, you're booked in and no, no need to worry about that, just log in on the day. And of course, if you can't log in on the day, we will uh, send, we will we'll make the recording available 
and you can always check into that area which I showed you was here where we have all the webinars listed and then at the bottom of the page once the webinars have taken place we will post the recording in the on-demand session so not quite like Netflix but you get the idea that's what we're trying to do give you live content and give you stuff that you can just watch as and when so that's the first one done first of September 30 days we have 30 exhibitors we have 50 webinars and we are very pleased that you all joined us today so just like to say uh, goodbye for now from me and um, we look forward to seeing you at our future events we hope you've given you some kind of framework or outline for this uh, where it's very general today uh, we just wanted to show you who we are talk you through the site explain some of the do's and don'ts the upcoming webinars as you can see there's some very specific ones there on healthcare in Spain mortgages in France that's what we'll be talking about in detail with people who provide those services so if you want to get down and dirty in the specific nitty gritty about a particular subject, check out the webinar schedule and do book in. As I said, goodbye from me and I'll just pass over to Richard and Liz to say the same. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Goodbye. Bye everyone. Thank you.